um, hey, I, I, need a, I need a little bit of help here this morning because we're going to do just a, a little bit, a, a short little game, right? Um, so, um, and, and I'd like to have, I'd like to have um, younger kids if we could. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you what we're, what we're going to do. Kids, you've we'll played this game with you before, right, um, in, in kids' church. So I'm going to have you come up. You're going to stand up here. And then I'm going to have you go do something back there, and then you're going to come back out. So anyway, I know that's not a lot of information. Uh, but I need you to know that there's going to be a little action involved here. So if you're one of these that looks at people like this, um, you might not be a good one to come up here. So all right, so here we go. All right, so uh, Lizzie, Lizzie, come up. Okay. Um, yeah, I, what, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. It's been like seven years, but what is it? Claire, yeah. Come on. Yeah. I talked to you out there, and I didn't even ask you your name. How, how bad is that? But here I am asking you. Yeah, I know. Thank you. So she said, I was only like a couple months old last time I was here. So thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Some people are like, you don't know my name. All right, uh, let's see, we got two girls, let's get a boy. Um, sorry, let's, or not. What was it? Elijah, yeah, you'll be good. Come on up. Come on up. So here's what's going to happen. Um, uh, so we got Elijah, Claire, and Lizzie. Are you sure you want to do this? Okay, I'm just making sure. You look thrilled. All right, here we go. You're a good dude. I like you. So would you guys just kind of stand up here? Okay, let everybody kind of see you and, and look out there and see them, okay? All right, so now I want you to walk back through this room, okay? There's an opening right there, okay? I want you to go in there, and I want to make sure that you can hear me, right? So go ahead, uh, there's some chairs back there, just, just kind of go down there. So I'll be right here so you can make sure that you hear me also. Um, I, I need that, actually. You can, thank you. Didn't know I had to say don't touch anything. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you guys do something for me. Are you listening? Okay. I need you to change one thing about your appearance. Okay. One thing about your appearance. Choose one, one simple thing that's simple, that's easy. You guys can do something, you know, you can work with each other, whatever you need to do. Change one thing about your appearance. Claire, you're looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. Remember, you volunteered for this. So Lizzie, help her out if she needs help. Okay, so they're going to change one thing about their appearance, and they're going to come out here, and they're going to stand here, all right? And we're going to see if we can figure out the one thing that they changed about their appearance. Now, I'm going to change one thing about my appearance as well, all right? So I'm going to go back here so we can see the one thing, okay? All right? So, Claire, you got it? Okay, very good. You guys ready? Okay. Now, this is going to be difficult, okay, because it's going to be really subtle, all right? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, okay, they can hear me, so don't say it too loud. All right, go on out here. Go back out. Okay, good. Elijah's coming. Okay, very good. Remember, it's really, it's really good if you're subtle, okay, so that they can't tell what you did, okay? So I did something really subtle as well. Okay, go ahead. Stand up here, okay? All right, here, let me take, nobody saw that, right? Okay, all right, so we're going to stand here. Uh, so Elijah, Elijah did something really subtle, okay, to his look, right? First of all, he started smiling, all right, <laughs> that's good, that's good, but he did something else. Can anyone guess what he did? Let's see, I'm going to have the, I'll have the kids guess here. All right, so let's see here. Um, uh, Olivia, can you tell what Elijah did? Changed his hairstyle. Is that what you did? Changed your hairstyle? Is that a yes or yes? Yes, that's what he did. I'll give Olivia a hand. She changed that. Good job. Okay, come over here. Now, yeah, fix that. Okay, now Lizzie did something. She changed something about her look. 
Does anyone know what Lizzie changed about her look? Anyone? Because I, I have no idea. I don't know what they did while they were back there. Okay? Can anyone see what Lizzie did? Mom and Dad, can you tell? She rolled up her sleeve? Is that what you did? Oh, nice. Wow. Did anyone else get that? I had no idea. I was going, I blew this. Oh, Claire got it. Okay. Uh, so Claire did something very subtle, very subtle with her appearance. Can anyone tell what Claire did with her appearance? Who's, is that Gideon? I can't see back there. What'd she do? She took off her shoes. Is that right? Good job, Gideon. Give Gideon a hand. Now, sorry if I blew that for you. I just felt like you standing like here, they'd think I arrested you or something. All right, now, I did something really subtle <laughs> with my look as well. What, what happened? I have a tag hanging out? Oh, so they know it's fake? Oh, man. Give them a hand. Thank you. You guys can go sit down. Thank you very much. Now, so before, uh, before I came into, sorry, David, you're going to have to turn this back on when you get up here because it's just blowing my papers. Uh, so I showed up to church this morning, and, and I, I was doing a little test. Now, this is like a week-long test, okay, just a, a week-long effort into this one small little sermon illustration that I'm about to do. So, can anybody tell that I'm growing something here? All right? Now, I wanted to count how many people said something to me about this hideous looking thing on my, I'm sorry, man. I just, it's just not my thing. I get to this point and I'm going, all right, done. Can't do it anymore, right? Martha can't stand it, obviously, right? So I tallied it up. I had 11 different people say something about this, all right? And now they mentioned different things. Some of them said, oh, you do have gray hair, right? Because I got little, little ones. In. I had one person say, oh, you're a redhead? I had no idea. I am also a red face, apparently, all right? I had some people say, Evan was like, hey, keep going, it'll get there, right? <laughs> like, you, you just got to push through it. You have to push through it. My problem is it doesn't really ever connect, and I get this patchy thing. And uh, the worst part is, I, again, I just, some of you guys, man, some of you guys just like, you do this, and it, it's great. You got, you, I just, I, I can't push through. It, I have a difficult time. Although I'm on vacation for the next week, or not this week, but next Sunday I'll be gone and the Sunday after that. And so that might be an opportunity, although usually my kids go, what are you doing? Please do something with that thing. But it's interesting, it's interesting the things that we notice, the things that catch our attention, the things that we are aware of. Now, those of you that have known me for a long time, I've never done this, right? So for me to show up this morning, my favorite one was I was in a conversation out in the hallway, and I'm standing here, and I was talking to somebody else over here, and Naomi Goodwin walks by, and this is literally what I see out of the corner of my eye. Naomi goes... And keeps walking. Then Christina comes out and goes, so Naomi told me that you're growing a little facial hair. And apparently she was a little alarmed by this. What is Pastor Robbie doing? I love you, Naomi. She's great. But the things that we notice, the things that catch our attention... The things that we observe, the perspective that we have. 
today we're looking at a story where observation was everything, where perspective was everything, where having the correct perspective and being able to see a situation in the right context meant all the difference. In Luke chapter 10, we have a really, really famous story. It's the story, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I say this is really famous because this is a story that even if you have never read the Bible, even if you've probably never stepped foot in a church before, most people will be familiar with this story. See, in our society, the term Samaritan has become synonymous with one who goes out of their way or steps out of their comfort zone to do something to help another person who is in need, right? Most people, if you say Good Samaritan, they'll be able to have a definition for what that means. So in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, will you stand with me if you're able or willing, or both. The parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. And I can imagine Jesus probably thought this was the end of the conversation. And that would have been a great story. But there's no parable yet. But that would have been a great place for Jesus to go, he already knows. He knows what it takes. He knows what to do to inherit Eternal life. Love God. Love others. You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. It could have stopped right there. But the the teacher of the law, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself, verse 29 says. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look at him, or look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for an extra, any extra expense that you may have. And then Jesus says this, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So let's understand what's going on here a little bit now. And I don't claim to today to be able to give you or, or expect that you will leave here today with anything brand new out of this story. This is a very familiar story. My goal today is for us to just be reminded. To be reminded. If you leave here and you go, wow, I never really thought about that part, that's great. That's great. A lot of times I stand up here and I want to I want to offer things that maybe we've never really considered before. I don't know that that's going to happen today. But if you leave here going, yeah. I needed to be reminded of that. Then we've accomplished something 
today. So this passage starts with a question. And it's a question that Jesus has been asked before and will be asked again. The expert in the law, in an attempt to trap him, in an attempt, an attempt to test him, in an attempt to, to appear smarter than him, to get Jesus to say something that will make everyone else go, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. In an attempt to do all those things, he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, this expert in the law had heard over and over Jesus use this terminology that there is a life after this one. That there's a life that, 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 is, that is more exciting than the current life that you're living. And he wasn't just talking about, when Jesus talks about eternal life, he's not just talking about what happens when we die. That's a big part of it. What he's talking about also is that there's more to life than just this. There's more to life than just the way you've been living it. There is a crazy, awesome, incredible life out there. And it's found in me, says Jesus. And if you will follow me, like he said to the disciples we talked about last week, the fishermen who became disciples. If you will follow me, I will lead you to a life that you never imagined. That full, abundant life that he talks about, that John writes about in, in chapter 10. That's part of the eternal life that he calls us to. And so this question of, okay, Jesus, what do I have to do to get this eternal life that you're talking about? That was an important question. But the intent, the intent of the question was to test, and it was to trap, and it was to get him to get Jesus to say something controversial, to get him to say something that didn't make sense so that they could go, ha, see, he's full of it. They were constantly doing that. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, how do you read it? How do you read the law that you so astutely uphold? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, yep, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> Do this and you will live. Not just live, but really live. Truly live. But that wasn't good enough. Because he hadn't tricked Jesus yet. He hadn't tested him enough. He hadn't got Jesus angry. He hadn't got Jesus to the point where Jesus got frustrated. So in order to justify himself, you hear that? This teacher on the law is trying to justify himself. This was all about him. He was trying to look good. And so he asks a question that he thinks is going to trick Jesus. But he learns something in the end. He asks, okay. If I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, you can almost hear him say, Jesus, you tell me who my neighbor is. Who is my neighbor? That's a tough question to answer. Who is my neighbor? If I ask you today, hey, tell me about your neighbor, you would probably go to the person next door. Or you would think, oh, the person next door, the person across the street, the, the people on my block, those are my neighbors. But you wouldn't really know where to stop, right? There's no, like, there's no definition of that's my neighbor, right? Those are just the people I live close to. So if I only love my neighbor as myself, what about the people in my own house? So I don't have to love them as I love myself? What about the, so I've decided that my neighborhood is four blocks wide. So everyone outside of that, I don't have to love as I love myself. So you see how this question can get tricky. And then Jesus answers who our neighbor is with this parable. 
So let's talk about the parable. Let's talk about the story and why Jesus asked this, why Jesus answered this way, why Jesus went into this whole long story. First of all, we have to understand this road. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho, where this man was found half dead, as the story says. So the road from Jerusalem to Jericho would have been really well traveled, but it would have been a really rugged road, a really rugged journey. It was 17 miles, okay, 17 miles. However, Jerusalem was 3,300 feet higher in elevation than Jericho. So you can imagine more than half of a mile in elevation change in 17 miles. And this was almost exclusively done on foot. There was twists, there were turns, there was rocks, there were boulders. And what happened was it, it made for a great place for robbers to hang out. People that would look for individuals who would have been traveling by themselves and take advantage of them. So normally people would travel in a caravan. Something happened to this man, and we can assume that he was traveling by himself. We'll come back to that. So there's two main points to this story, and I don't want to dive into the story itself too much, because we're all pretty familiar with it. Two main points. The first one is this. Followers of Christ are called to show compassion and mercy to anyone who is in need. Anyone who is in need. Now the Samaritan gets, Jesus talks about him glowingly, right? The Samaritan gets the credit for being neighborly. So what does the Samaritan do? The first thing the Samaritan does, and we'll look, we'll look at the other two in just a minute, and we'll see how important this was. It says that the Samaritan came where the man was and took pity on him or had compassion on him. He went the extra mile, right? He tended to his immediate needs, all right, his physical, right? He was beat up. It says he was left half dead, he sacrificed his own position, all right? He stopped whatever he was doing. We never learn what the Samaritan was doing, where he was going, why he was going there. It doesn't even really say which way he was going. But he was on his way doing something. He must have had something to do, but he stopped. And he went over to the man. He stopped whatever he's in the middle of and gave time to this person. Did you notice that he stayed overnight. Once he took the man to the inn and asked him, asked the innkeeper to take care of him, okay, he stayed overnight. It wasn't until the next day that he asked the innkeeper, hey, watch after him, take care of him, whatever you need, whatever expenses you're out, I will pay for it. So not only did he stop his journey to go over and talk to the man, he puts the man on his own donkey. This is huge. This is a part of the story that doesn't get enough credit. He did two things. First of all, he said, I will walk the rest of the journey. Because I'm putting this man on my donkey. So he walked, however far it was. Not only that, but to walk and lead a donkey with another person on it, half dead or not, was a sign that you were working for that man. So he put himself in a position of servanthood and he walked that donkey, walked that man to where he needed to be. He tended to the immediate needs. And then he didn't say, hey, I've done enough. I've done all I can do, right? I did, I, that's all I know how to do. 
I poured oil, wine. You know, ever been there? Like, well, that's about the extent of my knowledge, right? No, he said, I'm going to take him somewhere where someone else knows what to do. I'm going to do more than just simply say, hey, I mean, I did more than that priest did. I did more than that Levite did. No, he took him and he tended to his long-term needs. He also set aside the cultural expectations which said the Jews don't hang out with Samaritans. And Samaritans don't hang out with Jews. Not only do they not hang out, but a Samaritan should have never been the one to stop. The Samaritan should have been the one that said, oh, no, we don't talk, remember? Oh, we butt heads, so of course I'm not going to take care of you in your time of deepest need. But the Samaritan stopped. Second point is religion can often get in the way of demonstrating God's compassion for people. Let me say that again. Religion can often get in the way of demonstrating God's compassion for people. See, the priest and the Levite were representative of the religious leadership and the temple authority. Both were going down from Jerusalem, so they were traveling downhill. It was rough. But what we can assume was whatever they were doing in Jerusalem was part of their calling, right? And I can only imagine, I don't want to add to the story, but I can only imagine, I wonder how much during that time they were in Jerusalem, they had preached to the people about taking care of one another about God's love and about what God expects of us, what it means, what it means to, to love my neighbor as myself. And for some reason, they walked out of that realm and started going down, and they see a man half dead. And not only did they keep walking, they purposefully moved to the other side of the road. Ouch. So here's this expert in the law listening to this. And you can imagine how this must have cut through that Jewish audience. Because there was an audience. It was more than just this man. And can you imagine the anger the must have started to boil. How could they do that? How could they avoid the man and just walk past him? Not only that, I wonder how angry they got at Jesus. How dare he portray us that way? They purposely moved to the other side. We know it was on purpose because the story says they saw the man. They saw him and passed on the other side. We don't know why for sure, but there was some part of this that was a serious inconvenience for these two people, for these two priests, these two religious leaders. Most likely it was time. See, there. Law said, if they came in contact with a dead body, they would have to go through this week-long ritual of purification. So it wasn't necessarily this, oh, gross, there might be a dead body over there. It was most likely more of a, oh man, if I go over there, like I'm out for a week. Like, that's a whole week out of my life. I can't do that. That's just too much. That's too much of a sacrifice. It's not worth it. Not worth it at all. I wonder also, again, this is just Robbie wondering. 
I wonder if they thought he deserved it. I wonder if they thought he deserved it. Who in their right mind travels this road by themselves? Doesn't he know what happens on roads like this? Come on. He's traveled this road hundreds of times. He had to have known what could have happened. Why would he be by himself? And we waste time. And they waste time trying to figure out how someone got into this position instead of just meeting the immediate needs that are right in front of them. And how often do we do that? How often do we do that? Church, you know I say things sometimes that cuts to our being, right? I've seen a lot of stuff this week on this whole border, kids being taken from their parents. And you know what I see most of all? is people arguing about whose fault it is. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Instead of asking what can I do and what's my responsibility here, we're going to waste our time arguing about whose fault it is? I don't know all the politics involved. Quite frankly, I can't stand politics. I think I've said that a few times. But we're really going to waste our time? And I wonder, I wonder if that's part of this story. Oh, he, sh oh, he, des he probably deserves. No, but he doesn't deserve anybody to help him. He should have known better. Well, they shouldn't break the law. If they didn't break the law, then they wouldn't be in this situation. Mm, that's a dangerous road to go down. Mm. I'm not sure that would have been Jesus' response. That's not a political statement. That's not meant to beat anybody up. And I plan to talk about this way before all this stuff came up. But the point is, we can waste time and energy and effort arguing about why we're in a situation. And I wonder if Jesus would have just went, you know what? We can figure out why later. But there's a man laying here half dead. He's half dead. And you want to figure out why he's there. I wonder, half dead in historic writings usually meant he wasn't moving and he appeared dead. That's usually what it means. Wasn't moving, appeared dead. I wonder how much they just assumed that he was gone, done, no point messing with it, don't really have time to go check it out myself. If he is dead, then it's the whole purification process. But how often, how often do we write people off? Too far gone. Yeah, way too far down that road. No chance. It's, it's, it's a worthless effort on my part to try to do anything about their situation. Because they're too far gone. How often do we assume that someone is a lost cause and not even make the effort? We decide that the situation is so bleak that it's not even worth the sacrifice. But the Samaritan came 
to where the man was. While the religious leaders saw the man, and he passed on the other side. So who's my neighbor? Who's our neighbor? I don't think I know. And isn't it interesting, if you really read this story, Jesus never says, that person's your neighbor. All he says is, this is the person who was being a good neighbor. This is about us. Who my neighbor is isn't about them. Anyone in need is our neighbor. The story is about us. It's about are we being neighborly? Because he asked the expert in the law, he says, which one of these do you think was a good neighbor to his fellow man? And you notice the teacher of the law couldn't even say the Samaritan. He wouldn't even say it. He wouldn't acknowledge that the man that he despised the most was actually the one who was being the most neighborly. He says, the one who showed mercy. It's not about who the neighbor is. It's about, has God formed you, shaped you, and am I willing to be the neighbor that someone else needs. No matter what comes of this, no matter who I bump into, no matter what need shows up, what, no matter, none of that matters. Will I be the neighbor that God calls me to be?